Well, I guess we can get started. So anybody tap yet? I'm the only one? Okay. <laughs> it is early, um, I will say that. So, so we're going to kind of jump around just a little bit today during the presentation. Um, we're going to start by boiling some syrup. We're going to make uh, hard maple candy um, for one of, the, one of the things that we're going to do today. And then, um, then we're going to make a maple cheesecake on the tail end. And then we're going to talk about some other, other value-added maple products. So um, Samara will be boiling our syrup and, and watching our pot here. So um, we're starting off with uh, 10 ounces of syrup, just a small amount. Um, so what we did yesterday is we boiled uh, the thermometer to kind of come up with the uh, boiling point here at this location. Um, we are going to be adding 88 degrees onto the boiling point to finish this candy. So we are going to be going up to, for an ending temperature of 298.7 is where we're going to try and land for making this candy. So one thing that I will say that, um, so we're going to make some suckers and we're going to make candy. Basically, it's the same recipe for both. Yep. That is just a, a recipe that, that comes like off CDL's website. And we'll, we'll touch on that during the, the presentation of, you know, all the different value added products in the, in the different places that we can find the information for what we, you know, what we go over the boiling point. So we'll touch on that just a little bit later. So one thing that is your friend is uh, a light coat of cooking spray in your candy molds. Otherwise, in your sucker molds, otherwise um, you will, you will not like the outcome. So they will stick in there pretty, pretty heavily. So. <clears throat> like I said, we started out with 10 ounces of, of uh, syrup. We're using a fairly light syrup uh, for this. That's the syrup that we're using in this uh, cooking. So like I mentioned, we're going to go 88 over the boiling point. We also added, uh, for that amount, we added about an eighth of a teaspoon of dry defoamer to help uh, keep the foam down in, in, this, uh, in this application. So if you want to fire it up here, I guess we'll, uh, I think we're on four yesterday, huh? So I'm just going to lay some, some, some molds in the, I learned a few things yesterday of everything I should be doing and shouldn't be doing beforehand here. So we'll put a couple sucker sticks in the molds and <clears throat> so like I say, we're going to, we're going to start with that. She's going to, she's going to boil. We, we got, we're going to keep the lights on for the first portion of this so that she can kind of keep an eye on the temperature and all that good stuff. So, okay. So a, a great reference for any of the stuff that has to do with making maple syrup or making value-added maple products is the North American Syrup Producers Manual. So they just released the latest version of it last year, which is going to be the third edition. So if you, if you scan that QR code with your phone, that'll take you to a, a website called mapleresearch.org. You can go on the mapleresearch.org website and you can download this manual for free. It is a very large manual. It is 434 pages, so it is something that you probably don't want to print. Um, if you do want a print copy of this manual, you can purchase it from the Wisconsin Maple Syrup Producers Association. I believe their uh, a spiral bound soft cover, I believe is around 50 or $55. I don't know if they have any of the hard copy, hard covers available. I know those were quite expensive, but like I say, so those are available through the Wisconsin Maple Association, I think, or you can order them online as well. Um, it is a great reference. So any of the things that we're talking about, whether it be maple cream, maple sugar, maple candy, maple cotton candy, a lot of that information can be found also in this manual. Not to discount YouTube or anything, but this is great, solid information um, that's been university vetted and, and, and good, accurate information. Sometimes some of the stuff that we see out there on the internet, whether it be on YouTube or on Facebook or some of these other places, some of that information probably isn't the, the greatest information that we should be using. So nice, solid reference, great information. So like I say, you can download it for free if you'd like. Um, another one here, there's another QR code up here. And basically this is just a, a guide for, for making maple syrup. Uh, this was something, a technical publication that was put out by the University of Vermont. It is another great reference uh, reference uh, material that can be downloaded as well for free. Uh, gives you a lot of good, valuable information. So, like I say, two really good references 
to find a lot of information about uh, uh, maple syrup and value-added maple products. So. so when we talk about value-added maple products, uh, you know, looking back for, for, for me and for our family's business, value-added maple products have, have done really well for us over the years. You know, so when we go to a farmer's market on a Saturday morning, we need to differentiate our business from everybody else's. I mean, that really is the key. Everybody that goes down to the farmer's market has maple syrup for sale, but they don't necessarily have maple cream, maple cotton candy, maple hard candy, maple suckers, maple mustard, maple barbecue sauce, maple root beer. So the larger product offering that you have of maple products when you go to these events, one, the more traffic you're going to get to your booth. Second, the more repeat customers you'll have. And third, you know, you're going to get a lot of people that are going to come to your booth and try maple for the first time, probably not necessarily as maple syrup, but as one of the value added products. And by having that value added product line, when you're at the, like your local farmer's market, it really gives you an opportunity to like say differentiate or set yourself apart from the other producers by having a larger product offering. Plus, it's also a way to get a lot more money for your syrup when you make it into a, a value-added product. You know, so some of the maple uh, value-added products that are out there are maple sugar, maple cream, maple candy, maple suckers, um, maple coated nuts, maple cotton candy, flavor-infused syrups, uh, basically maple products as an ingredient, and the list goes on. You know, there are a lot of different value-added maple products out there that, that people have started making over the years that that has really brought a lot of attention into the, into the maple industry. Okay, so when we look at the composition of sap, you know, that's really kind of where we need to start. So basically sap is measured in degrees of bricks or percentage of solids. So that sap that's coming out of the woods, you know, we're measuring that in degrees of bricks to determine the, the amount of sugar that is in that solution. And the primary component that's in that solution is sucrose. Okay, so if I drill a tap hole into that maple tree, I can really, if I have sterile equipment, I can, you know, extract sterile sucrose from that tree. So that is really the primary sugar that we're, we're after. Sap also contains a lot of other things. Uh, it contains, you know, amino acids, phenolic compounds, uh, calcium, uh, minerals. So that sap contains a lot of other materials. And it's the combination of all these salts and phenolic acids and the boiling process that really brings us our maple flavor or gives us our maple flavor. So when we look at the composition of sap, we have another thing that we need to look at called invert sugars. So when we are talking about being successful at making any maple convection, we really need to talk about invert sugars. So like I had mentioned before, we can get sterile sucrose to come out of that tap hole. But the minute that that sucrose comes in contact with our dirty taps, our dirty tubing system, um, higher air temperatures, higher ambient air temperatures like we've had the last number of days up in the 50s, we start to take that 12 carbon sugar, which is sucrose, and that sugar actually starts to split into two six carbon sugars, which are glucose and fructose. Okay, so the higher that the level of glucose and fructose goes, the more sugar that is split, the higher our invert sugar level starts to rise. And that drastically, like I say, affects the quality of the syrup when it comes to making maple convections, you know, such as your value added maple products. So like I say, we've got the, we just got the, the chemical diagram basically of what, what glucose and fructose look like up there. But like I say, really, once it comes in contact with temperature or our dirty equipment, that's when we start to see the split. So when we talk about the split, you know, once that 12 carbon sugar has split, we cannot put it together. Reboiling doesn't fix it, ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, none of the processing equipment can put that sugar back together. So once that sucrose is split into glucose and fructose, it can't go back together. So like I say, there's, there's no way that, that we can put it back together. So with that being said, <clears throat> when we look at invert sugars, invert sugars are typically lowest early on in the maple season, okay? So what's going on early in the maple season? Our air temperatures are low, 
Our runs are relatively small. The air temperature is cool. The days are short. We don't see a lot of heating. So we don't grow a lot of microbial contamination. You know, our, our equipment is relatively clean. As the year drags on, our days get longer. Our ambient air temperatures start to increase. Our equipment gets dirtier. And therefore, the level of invert sugar starts to increase. So with that being said, a general, a broad general statement is early season syrups usually, usually have low invert. Now I can tell you we were boiling on Monday night and I had sap coming into my RO that was 60 degrees. So I can guarantee you my level of invert earlier this week probably isn't what you would be looking for for, you know, really low invert syrup that you would typically make this time of year when we are early in the season and the, and the temperatures aren't so warm. So like say, with that, with that being said, equipment technology has gotten really good. Um, today we have, you know, air injection, reverse osmosis, ultra filtration, sap filtration. I mean, you name it in the maple industry, we've got it. So we can take some really crummy looking sap and we can make some decent syrup out of it. You know, where 20, 25 years ago, we probably wouldn't have been able to process it. But with today's equipment and the evaporators and like say the technology that we have today, we can process it. So a lot of times we can make some very, very light syrup very late in the production season. So say, for example, on a typical year, not this year, on a typical year in central Wisconsin, you know, that would be late March into middle of April. We can make some of this very light syrup with the equipment that we have, but our invert is going to be just extremely elevated. So like I say, the generalization of lighter syrups usually have lower invert is correct if and it, it's a lot of it depends on the time of year it was produced and, and, and how it was made. So that's just a little bit about invert and, and just kind of like a broad generalization on that. So, so when, we measure, when we measure invert sugars, you know, really what we're going to do is we're going to use a tool called a blood glucose meter. That's really what we're going to do for, for measuring uh, that, that dilution of that glucose and that fructose in that, in that solution. So the tools that we will need to, to measure for, for sugar invert is we have a small digital gram scale that goes down into a one-tenth of a gram. So maple syrup is too thick of a solution to measure with a glucose meter just on its own. We have to dilute it with water. So what we'll do is we will do 10 grams of maple syrup and we will do 90 grams of water we will mix that in a container and, and put it into solution. Once we mix that into solution, um, we're gonna use a blood glucose meter. There's a little strip that slides down into the bottom. And then basically once that solution is mixed, you will slowly set this uh, test strip down into the solution. And that is gonna display a number on our display, which we're gonna use to measure our invert. So that is the equipment that we're going to need. Now I'm going to go into a little more detail into exactly what the equipment needs to be to get everything to correlate with the charts that are in the North American manual. So when we look at the meter, we need to purchase a meter that reads glucose in whole blood, okay? Because there are several different meters out there that you can buy on the market. So if you, re if you buy a meter that reads glucose in blood plasma, it's going to give you a false reading. It's going to be probably 10 to 15% higher than what it's supposed to be. So when we're purchasing a meter, we need to make sure that we're purchasing the correct meter. And like I had mentioned, we want one that's going to read glucose and whole blood. And the recommendations that we're, we're looking, that we're, we're basing this on, is that number that's going to be displayed on that little piece of equipment. We're going to take those numbers to the charts in the North American producers, or the North American syrup manual, and we're gonna calculate our invert. The other thing that when you buy a meter, you need the display to read milligrams in deciliters, okay? Some meters are just gonna say, when you dip the strip in there, it'll say high or low. They won't give you a number. 
So you need to make sure you're buying a meter that reads on the display milligrams and deciliters so that we, we get the correct reading. Okay, so in the North American manual, you're, you're going to find different charts like this. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that reading from that blood glucose meter, and we're gonna, that's going to calculate over and give us that 1 to 10 ratio for dilution of uh, percentage of invert. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to take that number, whoops, whoops, like I say, right off the meter. So the syrup we're using, I, I tested it before I came over here. That syrup is a, is a 40, and, and so that is a 0.8 uh, invert sugar on the syrup that we're using for making this candy. And it is also the same syrup that we're going to be making cheesecake later. That is the same syrup that we used basically to make, make this sugar. So very low invert for the, for the candy, very low invert for making the granulated sugar that we're going to use a little later on in the presentation. So let's talk a little bit about maple sugar. So when we look at maple sugar, it is a very versatile product and it is one of those products that you don't see a lot of maple syrup producers selling. So this is one of those value added products that you can add with relative ease and not have to purchase a lot of expensive equipment. So when we look at maple sugar, one gallon of 66 bricks maple syrup will yield us about 7.7 .7 pounds of maple sugar, okay? The nice thing with maple sugar is the average price for sugar is about $1.30 an ounce, which comes out to, if we make that gallon of syrup uh, into sugar, you know, we can look at about $159 per gallon for our syrup. Now, the nice thing with sugar is there's a company in Wisconsin, I believe it's Bellmark Printing. They do some labels and printing for the maple industry here in Wisconsin. They offer some Ziploc bags or zip top bags that are freestanding that you can package sugar in. I know there's a couple producers here in the state that are getting sugar bags from Bellmark. It's a, a, a kind of a, a cheap and easy way to package that sugar, like I say, without having to buy a bunch of specialty equipment. So when we look at maple sugar, maple sugar is really probably the most versatile component or the vers most versatile product that we can make out of maple syrup, okay? So what happens basically with maple sugar is we're boiling the majority of the water out of that product. So with all the water removed, we come up with something that is very shelf stable, um, very easy to store, and can be stored for a prolonged period of time without that product spoiling. So maple sugar can be also used as a one-to-one -one replacement in any of your cooking or baking recipes. It's like I say, it's very simple and easy to work with. Now, like I had mentioned, we, we had made the sugar for the cheesecake. We were using a, a relatively light syrup. We're using the syrup in the containers there. We, that's what we made the sugar from. So, you know, that particular uh, sugar is made out of golden maple syrup. So it's going to have a really light maple flavor. Okay. If you're looking for, oh, we're ready to go here. Okay. Got to take a little break here. And so... We're at about 262 on our thermometer. And when we get to this point, things start to go relatively fast. So the, the closer we get to that boiling point, uh, things, things want to go along relatively quickly here. So there's a lot of times that when we get closer, I'll actually pull the pan off the burner because the temperature is rising so fast, we'll kind of let it catch up. So like I had mentioned, we were at 262 before. We're already at 270, 271. So like I say, the temperature increases quite quickly. We're shooting for an ending temperature of 298.7. So we're just gonna let it boil here just a little bit longer. So we're about 277. Well, so yeah, so we're, well, like I say, but we're making, we're making the hard candy today is what we're going to make. Yeah, we're making hard candy today. So yeah, we're, we're 88 over on the hard candy. So we're about 287. I'm just going to kind of take it off the heat here just a little bit, kind of slow it down so we don't shoot too far past. About 289. Two ninety one, two ninety two, two ninety 
for 296, 297, 298. Okay, when you pour, pour, pour relatively slowly because it likes to foam up when you pour it into your cup. We're just using a, a Pyrex measuring cup. It likes to foam up kind of aggressively, so you want to make sure that you don't, uh, don't get too carried away. And then basically all we're going to do is we're going to take this liquid and we're going to, we're going to start pouring it in the molds. So we're going to pour a few suckers to start with. And I am by no means the most steady at this, so. That one's a little big. Any waste or chips that you have left over when you're making this, you can always take back out of here and add back into your next batch, so. That too, yep. <laughs> I know they usually don't last long at my house. My wife and my son have a tendency of getting them. So these are a different, yeah, these are a hard plastic mold. And that's one thing that we're going to talk about when we talk more in detail about making candy is, is the type of the molds that you're going to be using. Because this is a different candy mold than what you would use for the traditional, uh, the traditional molded soft candy. So... So we're going to let them cool and set, and we're going to talk about making these in more detail here in just a, in just a little bit. So, okay. So like I mentioned, when, you know, when we talk about syrup selection, you know, we, we really want to select a syrup for making sugar that has less than a 2% invert. Um, syrups that are over 2% invert will not work very well. So the problem that we have with making sugar out of high invert syrup is we can't get it to dry, okay? Sucrose dries down very well. It's like regular table sugar. It, it dries down very quickly. It stays granulated. The problem that we run into is when our invert sugars start to elevate as our glucose and sucrose levels increase, those two six carbon sugars retain moisture, okay? We can't get it dried out. So if we have too high of an invert sugar um, in our... Uh, in our syrup that we're going to use for making our granulated sugar, we are going to not be able to get that to dry down properly. We're not going to get it to granulate as well as we want it to. It's going to get clumpy. It's going to get sticky. And that's kind of what we're going to have with that. I'm going to turn off the light so that we can see this just a little bit better now that we're done boiling. So Samara doesn't have to watch the thermometer in the dark. So then I should probably, there we got that off. Okay. All righty. So like I said, we're going to use that chart, you know, like I say, to, to measure that, to take that, you know, to take that reading from that glucose meter. And we're going to look at that, that percentage of invert. So like say in every, every maple convection in the North American manual, whether it's going to be maple cream, maple sugar, maple candy, it's all going to have the, the syrup selection with the proper invert listed in that, in that manual. So this is where I'm going to say good syrup makes good sugar. Okay, we have a lot of people out there that are under the impression that I can take that, that late season syrup and I can make sugar out of it. Well, you can, but if the flavor of the syrup is kind of buddy, kind of bitter, um, you do not, how do I want to say it? You cannot eliminate that flavor. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions out there that if I boil all the water out of that off flavored late season syrup, I take all the smell out of that sugar, okay, and it will make good sugar. The problem is, is, is quality in, quality out. You know, if we try to take some marginal syrup that was made late season, the minute that I take that off flavored syrup, make it into sugar, the minute that I put it into a maple convection, uh, maple cotton candy is a, a great example of this. If you take a late season buddy syrup and put that, that, uh, that sugar into a cotton candy machine, It'll smell like you're boiling late season syrup or buddy syrup in your sugar house. It's amazing how that, that smell and that odor comes right back through and that smell and that odor basically end up in your maple convection or your cotton candy, whatever convection you're making. So like I say, good sugar or good syrup makes good sugar. So, you know, just kind of keep that in mind that we can't really hide that, that late season syrup very easily any place. So. When it comes to packaging maple sugar, uh, too high a moisture will cause the sugar to harden. 
Okay, so we, we don't want, you know, too high a moisture in there. Uh, the best way to check that moisture content is, is by a creep test. So basically what you're going to do is after you get your batch of, of sugar made and you're going to pour some of that onto a sheet of paper. And if you pour a pile onto a sheet of paper that's a couple inches tall, if you gently shake that piece of paper, that sugar should just slide right down the pile and spread right out. You know, that way we know we've got the moisture in that, in that sugar, you know, pretty close to correct. So like I say, creep test is really kind of the quick and easy way without having to buy some expensive moisture testing equipment. So uh, maple sugar is like say best packaged in an airtight container. You know, we don't want it to pick up outside moisture if we can, because like I say, it'll harden up a little bit if we, we get some extra moisture to it. So um, sugar can be sifted to remove large chunks, you know, so if you've got some chunks in your sugar, you can sift that stuff out. Don't throw the sugar away. You can add it to the syrup that's made in the next batch. So um, you can mix, you know, small amounts of sugar with a small KitchenAid mixer like I have up there. They don't like it that much. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they're not really that industrial of a, a device. But like I say, so I, I think I, I boiled a pint of, uh, a pint of syrup roughly is, is what I made in that batch of sugar. And I made it with that mixer right up there on the counter. It was just a, a quickie way to do it. I've made a, quite a bit of sugar with that mixer and haven't destroyed it the the biggest thing is small batches, you know, don't overload the mixer. If you're going to do larger volumes of sugar, you know, definitely look into a commercial Hobart mixer or something like that. Something that's more industrial use for making sugar. So, but like I say, it's a, it's a, it's one of those products, like I say, that we don't see a lot at the farmer's markets that a lot of people don't have. So it's one of those products that like I say, can, can kind of bolster your margins for your business. So. So we're going to talk a little bit about maple cream or maple butter. You know, this is a this is another one that that we don't see a lot at the markets. I know we make this uh, we make this in, in fairly big batches throughout the summer. We're kind of a seasonal producer of of maple cream. Um, you know, we'll we'll start with the farmers markets and then we run it through about Christmas time. But from from after Christmas until probably that that first uh, or end of May when our first farmers markets start up. We don't really do much for cream through the winter months, but it's one of those ones that, you know, through the summer months definitely is a, a good seller for us. So, so when we look at making maple cream, we, we want to make sure that we're looking at that, that invert sugar level as well. So we want to be, you know, ideally it would be nice if we were in this 1.4 to 1.6 range or less, um, for, for our invert sugar. So really kind of our, uh, you know, that is kind of our acceptable range. If we start to go past there, we're going to have to change our production method just a little bit on maple cream. So today we're talking about traditional maple cream. Okay, this is a maple cream product that there's nothing added to other than maple syrup. There are other processes out there that use a product called Invertase, which gives you a more shelf-stable cream. Uh, Invertase is essentially potassium sorbate. Um, that is the product that is that is contained in Invertase. We're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about more of the traditional uh, methods of, of making maple cream. So, talked about most of that. Okay, so when we look at sugar invert when making maple cream, we also need to look at adjusting our processing temperatures. So if we look at our sucrose reading from our meter here, if we're at 80 or below, we can be roughly 23 degrees over the boiling point with that particular syrup when we finish, that's our finish temperature for making that maple cream. If we change this reading just a little bit, we also need to change our ending temperatures, okay? So the higher our invert sugar goes, the higher our processing temperature has to be to be successful, okay? So kind of keep that in mind. So if we're pushing the edge of this and we get a, a, a Brix reading or a sucrose reading of around 77, you know, we want to make sure that we are up in that, you know, up in that 26 degrees over the boiling point for our finished temperature. So, so when we look at maple cream, one gallon of 66 Brix maple cream will make about 8.58 pounds of 88 Brix maple cream, which is about 137 ounces. The average price of maple cream is $1.19 or $1.15 per ounce. And the average price per gallon, you get about $157 for your gallon of syrup if you make it into cream. So cream does work out fairly well. The thing is with cream, it has a very short shelf life. So we're not going to discuss the whole process of making maple cream today. 
But when we package maple cream, maple cream is a cold pack product. Okay, so the sanitation of your facility is really critical. Okay, the last thing you want to do is go to the drawer and grab a wooden spoon out of your drawer to start stirring your maple cream. Okay, so when we talk about shelf life with maple cream, what we do at our sugar house is we make our maple cream, we run it through the machine, we package it into the cream tubs, and we stick it right in the freezer and we freeze it. And we take it to the farmer's market and we sell it frozen. And that usually lasts until the customer gets home and then they can put it in their fridge. Once it hits their fridge, depending on the sanitation practices at your facility, we should have around a six month shelf life in your fridge. So that's what we really tell the people when we're making traditional maple cream without adding any additives. But that's how we kind of skirt the, uh, <clears throat> skirt the, uh, the shelf life issue, like say, we keep them frozen until they're sold. And that way, you know, when people get them home, they've got a full six month shelf life and, and we're all set to go. So, <clears throat> so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, maple candy. Uh, this is the molded maple candy, not the hard maple candy like we just made earlier. So when we look at molded maple candy, one gallon of 66 bricks maple syrup will yield about eight pounds of 93 bricks molded candy or about 128 ounces. The average price per candy is about $1.50 per ounce. So when we make candy, we can make about $192 off a gallon of syrup if we make it into candy. This is one of the unique products that, that work really well at our sugar house. I will say my mom makes the candy. She's the, she's the candy master at our place, not, not me. Um, so every Saturday for the farmer's market, we will, we will make a double batch of maple candy. And we can't start selling at our farmer's market until 8 o'clock in the morning. They ring a bell. And usually in the morning, we'll have anywhere from 8 to 10 people lined up in front of our booth waiting to buy maple candy. Uh, well, like I say, we make a double batch every week. And the people know that if they don't get there, usually before 9.30 or 10 o'clock in the morning, we are sold out of candy. So by limiting how much we make, we also create our own demand, which is kind of nice. We sell out every week. We never have any left over. So I'd like to say it's, it's one of those products that, that work uh, very well for, uh, you know, bolstering, uh, bolstering your sales at the, your local farmer's market. Yeah, we have a bag of, bag of three. Yep. This, and, and, and candy molds are different sizes. So um, like say, depending on the size of molds, you know, we use a, a small maple leaf mold and I believe there's three candies in the package is how we package them up. So, and then we have our, our address in the weight of the package and all that stuff to be compliant as well. So uh, maple cotton candy is, is another one that we, uh, we do um, for, our, for our local farmer's market. So maple cotton candy is, is one of those things where we don't have a really, uh, how do I want to say it, a lot of input cost. Probably the biggest expense of the whole project is the cotton candy machine itself. So we had bought a kind of a middle of the road cotton candy machine for lack of better terminology. We didn't buy the really large commercial machine because we were, we're going to make some, but we're not making, uh, we're not going for uh, a Saturday afternoon where we're going to run the thing for six hours and make 200 bags of candy. So we bought something that was kind of in the middle of the road. Um, one of the keys to, to making good cotton candy is we need to make it in an environment that is dry. And usually cotton candy we make throughout the summer months for the farmer's market and the fair. So we have air conditioning in our bottling room to knock down that humidity level. So we usually make it in there. If we take that maple sugar out on a humid day, you know, like any other type of sugar, it wants to pick up that moisture quite rapidly out of the air. And then we get a, a cotton candy that's kind of clumpy and, and, and doesn't really fluff up nice in the bag. So like say a low humidity area is the best. You know, if you, if you want to take a cotton candy machine to a farmer's market on a drizzly Saturday in the middle of summer, it's probably not going to work very well. So what's that? Yeah, you can use a dehumidifier. That's correct. Right? Yep. That is correct. Yep. Yep. Just anything to get that moisture out of that facility where you're going to make it. So. Uh, invert sugar really plays a role in this. So like I had mentioned earlier on in the presentation, what do we know about glucose and fructose, our invert sugars? They retain moisture and they also absorb moisture very quickly. So if we have a sugar that was made with a relatively high invert, 
it's going to be a little bit harder to make that cotton candy come out of that machine very good with that higher invert sugar. So, so like say we had we had purchased a cotton candy machine that was kind of in the middle of the road. Um, the the top end machines have an adjustable amp setting which allow you to burn the burn the sugar out of the head just a little bit easier than what we've got. Um, like I say, if you're going to make a large volume of it, I would strongly recommend you getting more of a commercial machine. Like say, we, we, we picked that middle of the road because we were going to do some, but not a crazy amount. One thing that you want to do specify if you are going to buy a cotton candy machine for use for making uh, maple cotton candy is you do want to pick a machine that has a double ribbon head. Okay, so a regular cotton candy machine has a single ribbon or a single heating element. Uh, the dual ribbon heads have basically two, two heating elements on them. And what that does is that allows us to make a lot fluffier, more volumized cotton candy using less sugar. So actually the productivity or the profitability of that double ribbon head is, uh, is, is definitely worth a, worth a couple hundred bucks that you pay more for it because you're going to use way less sugar to make a larger volume of candy. So this is uh, one of the folks here in Wisconsin, uh, John Morley, makes a fair bit of cotton candy. When you go to package your cotton candy, when we started out, we started out packaging cotton candy basically in bags like this. We would package those bags the night prior to the farmer's market. We would fill those bags up so that they were nice and full. And because of the air that's left in the bag overnight, those bags would shrink down to like this. And it looked like you were only giving the person like a half a bag of cotton candy. It looked like you were kind of cheaping out on them. So when we look at packaging, you know, candy, cotton candy in bags like this, if it's at a fair or a festival or something and you can make it on the spot in a, in a temperature controlled or a humidity controlled environment, bags work very good. You know, our Wisconsin Maple Syrup Producers Association, our largest, <clears throat> excuse me, our largest source of income is going to be from cotton candy sales at State Fair. And, and the reason that we can make that cotton candy at State Fair is we're in the Wisconsin Ag Products building, which is an air-conditioned building. So we can make it in the middle of summer in that nice air-conditioned building and have very good success. We package everything in bags like this because it is almost immediately, well, most days that Barry's making cotton candy, he can't hardly keep up to the people that are buying it off the rack. So it never has the chance to shrink. Okay. So when we make it before the farmer's market, because we need that air conditioned or low humidity environment, we will package in these tubs. And the nice thing when you package in these tubs like this is you can, they're a plain tub, you can put your own label on them. They have a snap on cap that has a tamper evident seal. So once the cap is snapped on, you got to break the tamper evident cap to open it back up. The nice thing with these particular containers is you can pack those full and if you don't sell it at the farmer's market this week, you can sell it next week at the farmer's market, and it may have slid down maybe a quarter or three-eighths of an inch. It really is quite amazing how well that container stores cotton candy. So, you know, it is a little more expense. Bags are pennies a piece. This container is probably close to a dollar with the lid. But when you take it to the market, um, you know, a mom can buy some for their kid. They can have some of it. They can put the cap back on it, throw it in the stroller, throw it in the wagon with the family, and works just fine. So we've had very good luck with this. Now, this is a product that is going to be available through CDL. I think here probably within the next month or two, we should have the cotton candy tub tubs here in stock. So that's something like, say, that you can buy from us as well. They do work very well. So like, say, just it is a, a pretty good investment. So so the mix ratio, if you do not want to make your own sugar for making cotton candy, you can also purchase uh, sugar from a concession company. So the company that, that we got our cotton candy machine from is called Gold Metal, and they make a tremendous amount of concession equipment from spiral cut potato cutters to cotton candy machines and everything in between. Well, Gold Metal makes a ready-to-use maple floss sugar. So if you don't want to make your own sugar, your own maple sugar, and mix it with some white sugar, you can buy the pre-mixed product uh, made with maple sugar and white sugar for your event. So that's just one of the things out there that, that you can purchase that material. Um, 
The mixture for making cotton candy is, is really one part maple sugar and three parts white sugar. And, and the reason that we blend it with the white sugar is if we put regular traditional maple sugar into that cotton candy machine, it will gum it up and it will not come out of there. We need that low moisture content of that white sugar to be successful in our, in our cotton candy. Okay. Well, we use both. It, yeah, yeah, we use both. So, so we use uh, we usually run crystal sugar, which is beet sugar, um, and that's what we run. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, we've run. Yeah, that's all we run is crystal sugar, which is North Dakota based, and that's all beet sugar. So, so like I say, it's 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 one of those products. Like I say, that we can we can add you know some some fairly good dollars of sales into our into our maple syrup business at the farmers market. Um, let's talk a little bit about compliance. Of course, you know um, we got to make sure everybody knows what's involved with this. So anytime we sell a product labeled as candy in the state of Wisconsin, technically we are subject to report sales tax on those particular items. So if I sell cotton candy, or if I sell my candy as, well, my hard candy as candy and my soft molded candy as candy, I technically need to be reporting sales tax on that and filing a quarterly sales tax report. So just keep that in mind for compliance and audit. Well, I'm gonna scroll back a few slides. There's a few ways to skirt this. You can sell this as sugar. So we call it maple molded maple sugar. We don't call it candy because if we call it candy, we got to file sales tax report. If I sell this as maple sugar, I don't have to. So just kind of keep that in mind as a little different way to skirt it. But when we start talking hard candy and cotton candy, we are kind of subject to that. Uh, we are subject to that sales tax reporting. So Alan, so we're gonna we're gonna hand out uh, some samples of that candy that we just made. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. I'm so let's talk about thermometer calibration. So, and we're, we're going we're gonna to get to that here in just, just a second. So, so unfortunately, I'm, <laughs> I'm a terrible pourer, so I got some extra on there. How you can usually tell if you did a good job on your, on your candy is, uh, you know, just hold her up to the light. If you, if you got it right, it should look nice, clear, almost see-through. You shouldn't see any cracks or anything like that. So like I say, it is a, it is a very, uh, very easy product to make. These little guys here, these little suckers at the farmer's market, 75 cents a piece, you can't make them fast enough. So it is really quite amazing. I mean, during our county fair, we sell these things by the hundreds. In fact, my mom and dad just absolutely get sick of making them. So, <laughs> but like I say, this is just another one of them products that is very simple and easy to make that doesn't require a big investment in equipment or a lot of tools or anything like that. So, so we're going to talk a little bit <clears throat> about, about making that candy. So like I say, the recipe is the same. Basically, we're pouring the, the, the syrup, which is 88 over the boiling point, or into the sucker molds or into the candy molds. And now keep in mind, this was made with golden syrup. So it's going to have a very light maple flavor to the candy. It's not going to be very robust. Okay, so when we talk about uh, hard, hard candy, um, there's a really great reference on CDL's website. So if you go on CDL's website and you go on the How To tab or How To, <clears throat> uh, basically under Documents, you're going to go under How To Guides. There's going to be a ton of different uh, instructional pages out there for making jelly, making cream, making candy. A lot of it's going to say that you use it with a machine. You don't necessarily have to. So these how-to guides are, are all out on CDL's website. So now we're going to talk about your calibration of your thermometer. So basically, this is a picture in my kitchen last week of me boiling that thermometer in some water. So basically, I set it in there. And I let it boil and I let it roll, okay? I let it boil for a, several minutes and then basically I check my temperature. So last week at my house, that temperature boiled or that thermometer boiled at 209.8. And here we boiled at 
So you can see that we've got a couple degrees of difference. Okay, so what changes boiling point of water? Elevation above sea level is one, and atmospheric pressure is the other. So, what's that? Could very well be. So, the biggest problem when it comes to making maple confections is one, selecting the right syrup. That is the biggest problem. And the second one is nobody calibrates the thermometer. Everybody thinks a thermometer is a thermometer. Well, years ago, unfortunately, we got rid of the good thermometers. We got rid of the mercury thermometers. Those things were extremely accurate, very poor for food safety if they break, of course. That's why we got rid of them. But the accuracy of that thermometer was, was second to none. So when we look at making maple convections, the thing that people don't take the time to do is they don't take the time to boil that thermometer in water on, at that location on that day. And we can see this boiling point, like I say, change by a couple degrees. Now, everybody says, okay, water should boil at 212. Let's go back to science class. Well, 209.8 uh, 209 or whatever it says on that thermometer. So like I say, and every thermometer is just a little bit different. I can put four or five of those into a container and they'll all boil at a little bit different temperature. So like I say, have that known starting point because this is the temperature at which that water is going to boil that just about every recipe on CDL's website, you're going to add, like say for maple cream, you're going to add 22 degrees over the boiling point will be your finishing temperature. Maple candy will be 32 degrees over your boiling point. Hard maple candy, 88 degrees over the boiling point. It's all based on the boiling point of water at your location on that day. Okay, so that really is critical. So with that being said, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the mold. So these are a different mold than you would use for the soft maple candy. So the soft maple candy molds are, are more of a rubbery type material that we use. You know, we're usually pouring that in at about, depending on the recipe that you're using, um, if you're using a candy machine and you're pouring, it, pouring the syrup in hot to the candy machine, you're going to be roughly 32 degrees over the boiling point going into there. So um, when we look at hard candy, we're going to be 88 over. So when we look at the hard candy, we really need to get a plastic mold like this that is meant to handle up to roughly 300 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, so the molds, like I say, are going to be made of a different material. And like I say, for making the hard molded candy, that is the mold that we're looking for. We've got them out there in the store. And they come in a multitude of different shapes and sizes. Uh, sucker molds are, are kind of the same way. Um, you can uh, you know buy the sticks. I believe we got the sticks in stock out front and the sucker molds as well. Like I had mentioned before, when we had got started with this presentation, that cooking spray is the key. If you don't put cooking spray in there, you will struggle and pull your hair out and break most of your candy before it get it before it comes out of the mold, and you probably will might even tear up your molds in the process. So. Like I say, a little cooking spray goes a long way in, in the success of that project. So, so like I say, there's a picture of that, of that sucker mold. You can see we've got, they're, they're stained a little bit actually from, uh, if, if I had a quarter for every sucker that these molds have made, I could probably retire. So um, they, they've been around our sugar house a long time and, and made thousands and thousands of suckers, trust me. So, okay, so when we look at hard candy, um, now, this is a, a page right off, the, right off the CDL website, you know, and it's, if you follow the directions step by step, I'm not saying everything is foolproof, but it, it gets you pretty foolproof. I mean, it, it, it really gives you a really good idea of what you're doing. So, you know, what we did when we started boiling is, is, is we put, you know, roughly 10 ounces into that kettle. We put our thermometer clip on, and the next thing that we did is we added that dry to foamer. OK, so that it didn't foil, foam up right out of the pan. That is really one of the keys. Now, on CDL's website, they're going to say in here or mention in here that you can take a little bit of butter and put it around the ring of your pan. So if it foams up, it hits that butter and, and comes down. Well, in Wisconsin, not Canada, because this is a Canadian company in Wisconsin, we really can't do that. OK, we need to use an approved maple defoamer. OK, so if we are a licensed producer of maple syrup in Wisconsin, we have to use 
a approved maple defomer. So putting butter around the rim of that pan is, is not an acceptable practice here in this state anyways. So, but like I say, when you, when you talk about this, it's going to calibrate the cooking thermometer. Um, you know, it's got, you know, like in this particular recipe, you know, use one gallon of syrup. Well, we're not going to make that much candy. We're going to make a small batch. We're going to fill up a few molds, you know, my first batches that we made for this event were six ounces today. I made like about a 12 ounce batch, you know, to make just a little bit more so I could fill up all the mold. So like I say, you can make it with just a small amount. You don't have to, you know, this, this recipe says for using a candy machine, you don't have to use a candy machine. We just poured it into a, a measuring cup and simply poured it into the molds. Very simple and very straightforward. But like I say, if you follow these directions, I mean, it even, it even tells you right to the point where when the syrup starts to boil, cut the heat in half so that the syrup doesn't boil over. When the bubbles start to break small, you can increase the heat because your risk of boiling that syrup over disappears. So, I mean, there is a lot of good information, you know, in these step-by-step -step directions. And if you follow them step-by-step, -step, your chances of success are, are very great. So just kind of keep that in mind. So like I say, you know, we had went 88 over the boiling point of water. Um, I didn't take rubber gloves to handle the container. I just did it by hand, but be very careful when you're pouring out of the kettle into that measuring cup because it does kind of want to foam up as you pour. So like I say, candy or suckers, either way, you know, you can make, you know, you can use it with really with either recipe. So now we're going to, we're going to make a maple cheesecake, a real quick one. So don't get too critical on my cooking skills here though. Okay. So. Okay, so this is a very simple recipe. Um, eight ounces of whipped topping, eight ounces of softened cream cheese, a half a cup of maple sugar, and a graham cracker pie crust. Okay, very simple, relatively cheap to make. So what we're going to do is we're going to just uh, toss all this in the mixer. And we're going to let her whip here for a little bit. I got asked yesterday if you could use real cream. I'm sure it would probably work better than this. So I'm sure you can. I've never done it, but I'm sure it would work better probably. So, all right. All right, dump in the dump in the sugar. That is a half a cup of sugar. Half a cup of sugar. And we're gonna put the cream cheese in. I've never tried it that way, but it probably wouldn't. It probably wouldn't wouldn't set up nice. Okay. There is another recipe out there. My wife's got. And when we were up in Quebec, um, up at the factory, there is a. Uh, there is one that takes liquid syrup it's called sugar pie and it is yeah it is a slice of heaven i'll tell you what you're gonna be a diabetic when you're done with that one but uh it, it's good i'm she only makes it a couple times a year it's a it's it's really kind of a pain but i sweet talk her into it every once in a while sometimes it costs me okay so we're gonna let that we're gonna let that go here for just a little bit here we're gonna let that whip up here and okay so well, that's kind of whipping itself away here um any questions on, on any of the value-added maple products? Yeah. If you have gas, it is definitely nicer. Um, we have a propane stove in our bottling room. And that, if I need to cheat and make a small batch off-season or something, I'll make one in the house with a glass cooktop. But that gas burner definitely does cook a lot nicer and a lot faster. It's easier to control the heat. It's, I, I you know, when we, when we do all of our volumes... All of our volumes of maple cream that we make is all done in the bottling room on a gas stove. So, yeah. And and uh, right in CDL's directions, you'll find the same same thing too. It's going to state that if you know propane is definitely better if you have it available. So, all right. So, pretty simple and straightforward. We're just going <clears> to <throat> scrape this off a little bit here. Maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah. I like the beaters. 
Exactly, exactly. All righty. So all we're gonna do is we're just gonna scoop that out, put it in the put it in the pie crust, <clears throat> and then like say when it you know it's best if you can chill this overnight. That is really kind of the, the best way to to do this. And then if you can, uh, when before you serve it, you know put a little uh, sprinkle a little maple sugar on top of it. That really does. And this this is a this is a, a a recipe that I found out about about 25 years ago after a North American maple syrup conference meeting in Frankenmuth, Michigan, uh, Steve Childs from Cornell University um, put on a maple convection clinic. And I, me, my wife, and my family sat through that, that convections clinic that day. And uh, this is one of the things that he made during that convections clinic. Like say, just something quick, simple, easy. Like say, just get it leveled out in the pie crust. Something simple and straightforward, and then I'm just gonna take her back here and toss it in the cooler. I should hide it a little better this time, <laughs> so I can maybe get a piece of it next time. So let me just toss that in there real quick. Okay, so I'll throw the recipe up here for that. If you want to take a take a picture of it, and it, like say, very simple recipe: eight ounces of softened cream cheese, eight ounces of whipped topping. Of course, in this one, they're saying a, a, a half a cup of New York State maple sugar. Unfortunately, we're using Wisconsin maple sugar for this one. And then the graham cracker pie crust. Like, say, whip it all together and chill for 24 hours or chill overnight and then serve. It's like, say, it's a, it's a quick, easy way to, to make something if you're having an open house at the sugar house that, you know, you can serve with a breakfast or whatever the case may be. So, okay, any, any questions on anything? Ah, the, the soft candy goes really good. It, it does. We, I would say probably soft candy is two to one probably over hard. Sugar candy is going to be 32 degrees over the boiling point. Okay. The hard candy is 88, but sugar candy is going to be 32. So in a good rule of thumb too, you know, when you're, when you're doing cream or you're, or you're, you're, you're doing sugar like that, you know, a, a lot of times, like say, when you take, it'll be right in CDL's directions if you go to their website. A lot of times, you know, instead of 32 degrees, you might stop at 31 and a half and then take it off the heat because it continues to cook as it's off there. So the higher that we go in temperature, the quicker that happens. So just kind of keep that in mind. Well, that's so. the same like when you bake cookies and you take them out of the oven, they actually mm -hmm. too. Yep. Yeah, because they're definitely hot when they're coming out of there. So. Um. No, they're not. As, they're not. They're not chewy. They're they're more of a softer material. Yeah, soft and smooth material. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty good. Now, when you make the sugar, do you use like the KitchenAid too? I I for 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 this batch of sugar, I did use that mixer. It is hard on them. So, you got to make small batches, or you will wreck them. So how much? Okay, so like if you use a quart or a pint of maple syrup, how much sugar would that make? Oh, um, I'd have to do the math on it. It's going to make, you know, a pint's going to make just a couple pounds, you know, a pound and a half probably. So like I say, you just got to be, like I say, you got to be careful. Like I say, I usually make small volumes with this mixer because otherwise, like I say, if you, if you try to make a quart at a time in there, you will, yeah, you'll tear the gears right out of them. It just, it does not work very well for that. So, so the thing is I use just this, this is the, this is the one I use for, for doing sugar. I don't use a whisk or anything like that. So that's the one I use for doing sugar. So and how long does it take? 25 minutes, probably. Now, now the thing is when you, when you make sugar in there, you know, we are, it does get hotter than, so, I mean, even, so you, you'll take it off the stove, you're going to pour it in there, you're going to lock it in, start mixing, and it's going to increase in temperature because we're going to change states of matter. Okay. So we're going to go from a liquid to a solid so we're going to give off a fair bit of steam off that container. It's going to be get get pretty warm on you, you know. So if you know if you're going to do stir sugar, the old fashioned stir sugar, where you put it in a container like that and stir it by hand, you definitely want to wear rubber gloves because it definitely puts off a lot of steam. But even on your mixer, as it's stirring here, you're going to see a lot of steam come off that as we go from that liquid to that solid. So sugar will be 42 degrees over the boiling point. And like I say, you can take that right off the stove into the mixer bowl and start stirring it hot. There are some other recipes out there, other procedures for doing it. 
where you let sugar cool way off. And that's when it's really hard on the mixer because it's like trying to stir a batch of, you because know, frozen, ready. frozen gelatin. You know, it's, sure, it's already cooled down. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Getting to the point of letting it cool down. Some. You do that, you get a different sugar crystal. You will get a difference in sugar if you if you can stir cold syrup. You're feeling like a man. Your one arm is going to look like Joe Atlas. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. So, so you can, you can, yeah, you can, you can get a little different crystal if you stir it cold. It'll make a, a little bit bigger crystal, not a lot. So, yes, yeah. So when we CDL makes a sugar machine, and, and when we go through and we want that larger sugar crystal. It is variable speed and it is a slower speed on the rotor when we are trying to get to a larger sugar crystal. Yeah, and we do like that that candy machine. We we pour in hot right into that machine as well. That's a lot of times pouring in hot does does a lot better job. You know, it's you'll get a little bigger crystal cold, but sometimes it's hard to notice. So at least it's been my experience. So. Uh, the smaller crystal, you know, we get more fines with it. So that you know, when you when you get more put on a, more more powdery sugar, for lack of better terminology, yeah, you get more powder with it. It seems like, like this one, this batch here, like say this one, this one worked out pretty well. I mean, this is this is nice and grainy and flows good, and and like I say, so yeah. But that was that was hot right off the stove into the mixer. So that wasn't that wasn't you know cooling it off or anything. I just I've never had any good well. It's a great, you'll, you will wreck a mix. You'll wreck If you stir it cold, you will destroy this thing on the first day. So, yeah, yeah, you'll destroy that, like I say, on the first day if you go cold.